the topic for this class is uh, uh, market failure mythology. And, uh, and what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of my own research on this and then so, uh, some of uh, some other people's research on this. And uh, to, maybe to put it into a little historical perspective, uh, in the economics profession, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the theory of market failure was all the rage. And, uh, and this is at the same time when uh, economics became much more, much more quantitative. And uh, the, the model, the basic model of... Uh, of markets changed radically from, uh, you know, from before the time of Adam Smith until about the 1930s and 40s. Uh, anybody who wrote about markets and competition wrote the same way the Austrians did. You know, competition is dynamic, rivalrous process. They wrote about entrepreneurship and invention and product differentiation and the constant struggle to win over the consumers. But then in order to uh, model competition mathematically, the new model of perfect competition was, was developed. And I talked about this in my other talk a couple days ago. And so, and that was, that was developed, uh, I think actually in, in Frank Knight's famous book, uh, Risk, Uncertainty and Profit, he, the, you know, in the 1930s, he sort of laid out, or maybe 40, something like that, around 1940, he laid out the state of the art of competition theory today, and he had a chapter there on the on the perfect competition model. So from then forward, the the economics profession sort of went crazy with the, uh, spinning theories of market failure, because they had this new tool. They had this this utopian vision called perfect competition, and of course nothing on earth is perfect, and so uh, the, they, they they wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles about all the, the myriad failures of markets. Markets fail everywhere. And along, along with that, they had the monopolistic competition revolution, which said that even, even if you have a thousand competitors, if, uh, if 900 of them differentiate their product just a tiny little bit, then you have 900 monopolies because that's a monopoly is a single seller. And if you differentiate your product, you're a single seller, you're a monopoly. And so the, so the world is just, just plagued by a monopoly and market failure. Uh, and so, and so if, you, if you went to, say, one of the Ivy League schools for a graduate school in the 1950s or 60s, you would have been assigned a book uh, by a, a man named Francis Bator. Uh, it's, it's spelled his name like this. On market failure, there was a big, long book of readings um, that was sort of state of the art. This is why markets always fail, and and so, and that was the state of the art as of about the 1960s. And so, uh, and then along came uh, the public choice revolution in economics, and of course the the, the Austrians never went along with this because the Austrians always understood markets as dynamic. So and they so they never they never fell for this nirvana fallacy of comparing the real world markets to some utopian ideal, and and, and by the way another thing the Austrians never f always uh, insisted is that a lot of the things that are called market failures or imperfections uh, are you know they talk about legitimate problems pollution or something like that legitimate problems but human beings are problem solvers. And a lot of times you look at these problems when markets work slower than you would like them to work or the results are not uh, the best. Well, people solve these problems without government all the time. And so the, the Austrians always understood this. And even to this day, a lot of the research that is done, uh, applied research that is done by Austrian school economists is looking at some of these same old problems, uh, externality problems and so forth that have been uh, just assumed to be big problems for the society and, and see how private institutions solve them. For example, our friends at uh, the uh, Political Economy Research Center in Montana, uh, in the free market environmentalists, they call themselves, they invented the word enviropreneurship. Yeah, it's a combination of environmentalism and entrepreneurship. And they work with a lot of people out there in businesses who, who deal with environmental issues, pollution issues or erosion issues, uh, the denuding of forests and things like that. And, and they use uh, private contracts, private property, uh, voluntary solutions to solve these problems. 
Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago, spent her whole research career uh, researching on uh, 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 private voluntary uh, solutions to environmental, to commons problems, to environmental commons problems of communal property. Okay, and that, that's what she won the Nobel Prize for, you know, shockingly. She, she didn't win it for coming up with some new rationale for government interventionism and socialism. And so, uh, and so, and so she would have, and she was uh, a big friend. Uh, you know, I had met Eleanor Ostrom and her husband many years ago, and, and she she used to lecture from time to time at George Mason. Some of the Austrians there would invite her. So she was a fellow traveler of the Austrians. And uh, and if you're interested in that whole area, I would recommend looking her up, her uh, her writings up. It's O S. I'll, I'll spell her last name. Eleanor Ostrom. Okay. And so uh, so the public choice revolution came along. And uh, you know, develop this whole theory of what they call government failure. Uh, it's all about the incentives that exist within government and how the incentive system creates failures that match market failures. That uh, so the sort of the, the method of the, the methodology was individualism, methodological individualism, uh, but uh, as applied to political decision makers. And so they came up with this big body of literature in public choice economics that said, well, yes, markets fail, but that, that's not a sufficient condition for government intervention because government could come in and make things even worse because government also fails. So they called this a, a theory of uh, comparative institutions. They would compare the failed markets, the imperfect markets with the imperfect government and, and make a statement about it. So, you know, you know, governments might make things even worse. And that, and that did slow down the zeal of the market failure theorists, because they no longer could simply declare that uh, a market fails, therefore uh, governmental angels will come in and fix things, because they want, even if they are angels, the, the public choice people would say, the incentive system will cause them to screw up, you know, so they're sort of screwed up angels. You know, even, even so, and, the, and I heard James Buchanan, my old professor, say this a thousand times, you know, that, when people leave the private sector and go into government, they don't sprout devil's horns. But the, I thought he was wrong about that, but, he, but that's, that was his theory, that they're just like you and me, but they face vastly different incentives. There's no market feedback mechanism. And the, for example, I, I've written many times that uh, in government, failure is success in government. The worst job they do educating the kids, the more money we spend on the schools. The worst job they do helping poor people get out of poverty, the more we spend on poverty programs. NASA blows up the space shuttle. We give them a NASA a 50% budget increase the next year to do better next time. So the incentives are totally screwed up. They, they, they reward failure. So the worse you are, the, the wealthier you get in government. Just the opposite of the market, of the real market. But uh, so... So there's, but some of us never bought into this. This so, so where we were as of in the economics profession as of let's see the heyday. You know Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in 1986. So by then, the, I think the economics profession had taken a big step back on the market failure, not just because of the public choice people. There were a lot of Chicago school and Austrian school uh, uh, publish publications that also critique the the market failure model, and. But uh, it, we were at the stage where they had taken a step back. And on top of that, we have government failure. So it, it was just not legitimate to, uh, to make the argument that market failure alone is necessary and sufficient to argue for government intervention. But, uh, but some of us kept, um, began persisting in challenging a lot of the basic ideas of market failure in the first place. In, in a lot of different ways. And so that's what I want to talk about through the rest of the talk is some examples of how some of us from an Austrian perspective have looked at some of the main claims about market failure and have challenged them. And uh, claim number one is, uh, is uh, antitrust. The, the, the basic, the basic uh, rationale for antitrust regulation is that uh, in, the, in the United States anyway, and in other countries that have adopted antitrust regulation have all adopted the uh, the American model. In fact, when, when communism collapsed in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, one of the first things the U.S. government did was to send uh, uh, left-wing economists uh, all over Eastern and Central Europe 
to to make sure they they put you know, put in antitrust laws in their new the new regimes among other things you know the, you know you need antitrust laws you need our environmental laws you need you need to be like us is what is what they were saying and and so uh, so so this is not just an American thing but their basic rationale is that there was rampant monopolization uh, because of uh, corporate mergers in the late 19th century, especially in the 1880s, particularly in the 1880s. If you read almost any book uh, in, in the United States about the it says anything about the history of antitrust, that's what it will say. Uh, from, from the Chicago schools, Richard Posner, who's now a judge, he wrote a, a, a widely cited book on antitrust. Uh, it's been in print for about 40 years, I think. He says he uses the word rampant cartelization that was happening. They all say the same thing. And that was supposedly the rationale for antitrust laws to protect Americans, uh, consumers, from, from the, uh, the effects of rampant cartelization. And so one of my publications uh, uh, that was in the International Review of Law and Economics way back in 1985, I was five years old at the time, we were very young, yeah, somebody believes that. I guess some of some of you actually believe that. Um, well, I, I never I never bought this idea about rampant cartelization because I never saw the proof. You know, I was an economics major in school. I went through, got a PhD. I've been teaching antitrust economics for several years, industrial organization courses at George Mason, and I had never run across a single piece of proof that there was. You know, what, what do you mean rampant cartelization? And so. I looked into it, and you know, none of the books in the, in the George Mason Library at the time had evidence of this. And none of them mentioned one statistic. Richard Posner, you know, you think the Chicago School, which was at the time more critical than anyone of antitrust, would have some evidence to support this claim about sort of the immaculate conception of the antitrust laws, but <laughs> but but no. And so so I looked into it, and uh, I I got. Uh, and uh, I got a research assistant to uh, uh, send him to the to, to read through the uh, congressional record from 1888 to 1890, the two years prior to the Sherman Antitrust Act, and write down all the industries that were being accused by members of Congress of monopolizing, because that's that's who passed this law, the federal government. So we had a list of industries, and so the step number two was we need to find data. We the economics profession tells us, the mainstream tells us that uh, monopolists restrict output and raise prices. So what was going on with production levels and prices you know, over time in these industries that we have now have a list of that are being accused of monopolizing? And so we got some, for the first time ever, we gathered data, you know, no one else had ever done this. And we got what data, it was scattered, kind of spotty, and it's hard to get. You know, come from several different sources. It, uh, you know, I sent them down to the uh, the uh, the Census Bureau, and this was before the internet, where you couldn't just sit on your butt and type in U.S. Bureau of Census, uh, you know, statistical abstract for the United States. So we did some serious digging around, and and basically what we found was that in all of these industries, this was a period of uh, price deflation. The, the post-Civil War era in the United States from 1965 to the turn of the century, there was price deflation. The CPI fell by about, uh, during the decade, the decade before the Sherman Act, 1880 to 1890, it was negative 7%. So the, price, the CPI fell by 7%. Every one of these industries, the prices fell much more than 7%. So, so these were these were the the uh, biggest price reducing industries uh, in the country. What would you say to the argument that was just because of the inflation from the Civil War? Relative, <clears throat> it was only relative. Yeah, it was relative. Of course, it's relative to infla Civil War inflation, but that was uh, 25 years prior, and the Civil War ended in 1865, and I'm looking at 1889 here. So that, that was a long time. So. So, so, so we had, uh, and, and the price, the price level fell beginning around 1866. Anyway, the constant deflation in the U.S. all that all during that time, and so, so we found that these were the the most uh, vigorously price cutting uh, industries uh, for 10 years prior, and then then we also got the data for the next 10 years, and the same thing was happening. Prices continued to go down faster than the CPI, and these these industries. And then the data we got on production levels, we found many of these industries 
Uh, this was an, this was in a period of expanding production in the U.S. too. This was the industrial revolution in the United States. You know, all the great the great entrepreneurs, Vanderbilt and Carnegie and people like that, James J. Hill. They, you know, they were building railroads, and the steel industry was being developed, and the cement industry, and 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 so forth. And so uh, production was increasing. We found that these industries, uh, many of them, were increasing production three or four or five times faster than GDP had been growing. And so as a group, these industries that were singled out as being monopolies were the fastest growing, most innovating, most vigorously price cutting uh, uh, industries. And they were usually led by a few industry leaders like Rockefeller and the oil industry. You know, it wasn't everybody in these in these industries. And so and so that piece of evidence is just the opposite of what you would expect from rampant cartelization, isn't it, from a mainstream perspective, because the consumers were being tremendously benefited by all this price cutting. And it could not have been predatory pricing because no fool would cut prices for 20 years and lose money on purpose, lose money intentionally for 20 years in hopes that someday, someday we're going to make a killing you know, and this was back at a time when what was the average lifespan? 50, uh, you know, 55 uh, uh, at the, in the 1880s. Uh, you know, and so, so yes, but that's that's a theory that some people rely on that 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 wily John D. Rockefeller cut prices for 50 years, hoping to corner the oil market. <laughs> yeah, it's not someday drive everybody out from it. Predatory pricing. Yeah, there's uh, one of the one of the. The most harshest critiques of Rockefeller is a book uh, by Ida Tarbell, and the the chapter on on prices is called "Cutting to Kill," and and so there's, there's sort of this hysteria over over these people. It was all based on envy for the most part because they were doing great things like cutting prices. Of, you know, people in America lived in the dark until Rockefeller came along. Once the sun went down. Uh, if you didn't have money, if you weren't affluent, you had to, you couldn't afford uh, a, a light, you know. But now all of a sudden, everybody could afford uh, kerosene to, for their lamps, you know. You know, he literally helped uh, average working class Americans quit living in the dark, uh, things like that. And so he's gone down as you know one of the biggest villain, villains in there. I think Tom Woods coined a little slogan a couple of years ago that uh, I don't know if I can paraphrase it. That's something like, uh, you know, anyone who does great things for the American consumer is vilified as a criminal for the rest of his life. Something like that, you know, whether it's Sam Walton or Bill Gates or Rockefeller. Uh, you know, not that they've never done anything bad. You know, Bill Gates might might have beaten his children. I don't know. You know, you know <laughs> like like that football player from Minnesota. I mean, might have broken a tree branch off and clubbed his son. I don't know, but 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 I do know that his competitors have always hated him. And competitors only hate you if you're cutting your prices. They love you when you're raising your prices. You know your competitors. Um, a clarification of something? Oh yeah. I don't, I don't, we'll do a Q and A at the end, but oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So, so that's what we found. And so another thing I did with this research project is I got this my research assistant who still had some eyesight left because in, in these days he had to read the congressional record on microfilm in a library. You know, there was no book of the congressional record, you know, one of these machines where you crank some plastic roll, roll of plastic on. And I said, well, I want to know what the media were saying about all this at times. So let's look at the New York Times, the paper of record. And the New York Times originally thought this antitrust law was a good idea. Then they changed their mind and, uh, and uh, they came out against it because they observed all the antics of, of the members of Congress who passed the law. And what the antics were was the, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed in July of 1890. And Senator John Sherman's name was on it. He was the brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, by the way, the Civil War uh, dude, and who was, at the time had just, 1890, had just, he died, I think, in 1890, and he had just finished a 25-year war of genocide against the Plains Indians out west. So. So these were two charming gentlemen, uh, uh, <laughs> Senator John Sherman and his brother. And, uh, and, but anyway, uh, the New York Times uh, came out uh, vigorously against the Sherman Act because in October of 1890, uh, the same man, John, uh, John Sherman, sponsored the McKinley Tariff Bill, which at the time was the biggest increase in tariff rates in American history. So the great protector of the, cons of the consumer, John Sherman, with his Sherman Antitrust Act, three months later, 
signed what every uh, sponsored what everybody knew was a gigantic ripoff of the consumer, the big tariff increase. And so the New York Times concluded that the Sherman Act, they said it was a fig leaf designed to fool the public into thinking the Republican Party was the party of the consumer. They were protecting the consumer from these big, bad uh, monopolists, you know, John D. Rockefeller and, and all the other, all these other companies that were, that were uh, sort of madly cutting their prices decade after decade. We needed to be protected from that, they said. And, but then they saw that Sherman himself raised tariffs and everybody knew. The tariffs were bad. You know, New York City, even during the Civil War, New York City almost seceded from New York State and from the United States during the American Civil War years because it was a major international trade uh, port and they did a lot of business with the southern cotton traders and tobacco traders and they didn't want a war that would interfere with their lives and destroy their commerce. And so, you know, fast forward 25 years or so, uh, the New York Times was still a free trade uh, newspaper, and they and they, re and they recognized this as being horrible for the Port of New York, uh, you know, protectionist tariffs, and so uh, so they and so they immediately snuffed it out. And I think they had the right interpretation there. And so so this myth number, yeah, big myth number one, that antitrust was created to uh, to protect consumers from monopoly, uh, I think is a myth. I think I I proved it as a myth. And uh, I had a second paper also that was in the Review of Austrian Economics about how the state governments passed antitrust laws first before the federal government. And the same thing was true. The uh, prices were falling and they saw that as an emergency. We need to do something about falling beef prices, they said. So let's, let's raise the price of beef by force. You know, can't have cheap meat. You know, what, a, what, what an offense to society that would be. <laughs> okay. And, uh, so and myth number two is the myth of natural monopoly. And the basic story, the economic students in the room have heard the, the basic story. Well, by the way, a, a great book uh, on uh, the Austrian view of monopoly and antitrust is this one, Dominic Armentano, Antitrust and Monopoly. There's a skinny little version of it downstairs, but the, big, the fatter one is a classic. Uh, Armentano looked at the 55 most famous federal antitrust cases as of the early 80s, which is when it was published. So this is a, an old classic. And he found that in every single case of the 55 most famous federal antitrust cases, the companies were cutting prices, expanding production, inventing new products, doing anything but acting like monopolies. And so that's, that's why it's a classic. And that tells you something, doesn't it? He, he doesn't talk about the origins, though. I did the origins in my, my research. But because the Chicago school people will look at Armentano's book and they will say, well, yes, that's true. We agree with all of this. But there was a golden age of antitrust, so we still need it. As long as you put smart guys and gals like us in charge, then it'll work. You know, put, give us jobs at the Federal Trade Commission and we'll make it work right. But uh, so the purpose of my research was to, to make the argument that, no, there's something inherent. Antitrust is inherently incompatible with free market competition. It interferes with it. Now, the myth of natural monopoly, and you know, you've all seen the, the standard story goes something like this, that in certain types of industries with heavy fixed cost, the long run average cost, LAC, okay, is declining. Here's quantity and cost up here. And uh, the story goes that in, in these types of industries, like electric power, that uh, one big company will get here and produce at this level in a low, low average cost, and will therefore be able to underprice everybody and become a monopoly. It's sort of a version of the predatory pricing uh, argument. And so, and so once this one big company does that, it'll be able to price everybody out of the market, and the story of the basic theory goes that, well, that's not all bad, uh, you know, because after all, we want it would be nice to have one big company with economies of scale and produce things like electricity cheaply. But on the free market, they would charge a monopoly price. You know, they would charge some price up here. Oops. PM, monopoly price. Therefore, the government the story goes, should create on purpose a monopoly, give a monopoly franchise to one electric company, one, elect one water company, one telephone company, and then regulate the prices in the public interest. Okay, set some kind of price in the middle here. Let them make enough money 
to to make a profit, and uh, I'll call that the regulated price (PR). That's in a nutshell the theory of natural monopoly, and it has nothing to do with reality. Okay, this this never happened. This story of one big company monopolizing electric power and water supply and telephone never happened in, in the United States. I don't know if it, I don't think it ever happened anywhere else either. I doubt it. And here's one example. There's an article by uh, Harold Demsetz, the uh, U, the old UCLA economist Harold Demsetz, who looked into this once. <clears throat> and uh, this is in a book of his called Efficiency, Competition, and Public Policy about the history of uh, so-called na natural monopolies in the U.S. He said, six electric light companies were organized in one year of 1887 in New York City. 45 electric light enterprises had the legal right to operate in Chicago in 1907. Prior to 1895, Duluth, Minnesota was served by five electric lighting companies, and Scranton, Pennsylvania had four in 1906. During the latter part of the 19th century, competition was the usual situation in the gas industry in this country. Before 1884, six competing companies were operating in New York City. Competition was common and especially persistent in the telephone industry. Baltimore, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Detroit, Kansas City, and Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis had at least two telephone services in 1905. So this period, the, the turn of the 20th century, was supposedly when we had all this rampant uh, natural monopolies being created, it's not untrue. There's vigorous competition that, that happened in all these, all these areas. But we did end up with monopolies. How do we get monopolies? Well, in one of my papers, I'm reading from one of my pu old publications called The Myth of Natural Monopoly from the Re Review of Austrian Economics. And uh, I, I ran across an old book uh, uh, called The Gaslight Company of Baltimore by George T. Brown. And this was a, a very useful book because uh, it relied a good bit on some of the research done. I, I found this book in the Johns Hopkins University Library right down the street from my office. And, uh, and uh, Richard T. Ely, the co-founder of the American Economic Association, had taught at Johns Hopkins during this time. And this book was based, uh, a lot of the footnotes and things are based on his, his research. He'd done all kind of writing on the whole issue of electric util gas utilities, the gaslight company, and this whole natural monopoly business at, at the time. And so anyway, this book, The Gaslight Company of Baltimore, <coughs> explained how monopoly originally did appear, at least in the city of Baltimore, you know, the uh, so-called natural monopoly. And, and then, and this was one of the first. And once, it, it, once the, the politicians figured out this model, this technique of creating a monopoly, cities everywhere in the United States did the same thing, and other countries do. Uh, so here's what it says: When monopoly did appear, uh, it was it was solely because of government intervention. Okay, in in 1890, the year 1890, same year as the Sherman Act, a bill was introduced in the Maryland legislature which called for an annual payment to the city from the Consolidated Gas Company, which is what it was, Baltimore uh, Gas Company was called, of $10,000 a year and 3% of all dividends declared in return for the privilege of enjoying a 25-year monopoly. So the creation of the so-called natural monopolies through, through monopoly franchises was a share-the-loot scheme on the part of government. They said, we want to create a monopoly. And what, what, what do monopolies do? Well, they create monopoly profits, don't they? So give us $10,000 plus 3% of the profits every year. And then and we will give you a permanent monopoly. So it was a way of taxing the consumer of you know, the products of the gas light company and then later the electric power companies. That's the real reason why these were created. It wasn't, it wasn't that there was... Uh, uh, th this story right here in the graph. Uh, it wasn't the free market was creating this awful, uh, awful uh, menace. It was the politicians wanted to create monopolies as a way of sharing in the loot of, of uh, government-sponsored monopolies. There's another old article that I found. There's a... Uh, it's, it's kind of weird how these things... That one, one of my specialties in graduate school uh, was urban economics. Uh, I, you know, you had, you had to take a, a bunch of electives. So, uh, and, and when I went, when I was in graduate school back when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth, the the hardest 
prelim to pass was micro. Everybody knew the micro because uh, James Buchanan was in charge of it, and it was always uh, the hardest thing to pass. And so all my electives were labor economics, urban economics, environmental economics, any, anything that was micro-oriented, all my electives. So I thought that would, that would help me pass. You know, any questions I have on the comprehensive exam on micro, uh, you know, I'll have micro up to my eyeballs. And, and I used to read the Journal of Land Economics in one of these classes. And so I ran across this old article by this guy, Horace Gray, uh, on, on uh, the, the origins of natural monopolies. And, and it was a very interesting article, 1940, Horace Gray. And, uh, and, he, uh, and he pointed out, one of the things he pointed out is once this happened, once a couple of cities like Baltimore settled on this scheme to create, a, give a grant of monopoly, as long as you share some of the loot with the king, and the king was the mayor, city council, whoever it is. He said, every industry, every industry in the country all, all, all of a sudden was saying, hey, I'm natural too. You know, look how natural I am. He said, you know, and, and so they all, they all started calling, and this included, uh, it was his list, the radio industry, the real estate, milk, air transport, coal, oil, agriculture. And not only that, but then they also wanted patents, subsidies, tariffs, land grants, Monopoly franchises, that all happened. So all of these forms of monopoly were created. Now, it's now, now George Stigler, the late George Stigler, who, who also won the Nobel Prize in economics, one of the things he wanted for was his early research on this topic, on natural monopolies. And he did some statistical uh, uh, publications with a woman named Claire Friedland. She was his econometrician uh, at the University of Chicago. And... Uh, there's a book called The Citizen and the State that has all of George Stigler's essays on this uh, in it, if anyone is interest, ever interested. And basically what Stigler found was that once the government uh, created all these net, uh, monopolies and then uh, started regulating them, they were supposed to regulate the prices in the public interest, he found that the prices all went up. You know, what a shock. The government took over and set the prices, they all went up. And then one of his students, Greg Gerald, updated this several decades later, and he found that uh, once the state governments took it all over, this, this, there was sort of some of the cities started regulating these electric utilities and so forth, then state governments took it over for the most part. And he did a study of 25 states is, uh, that substituted state for municipal regulation of electric power between 1912 and 1917. And the effects of this was to raise electric rates by 46% and profits went up by 38%. And so that's the true history of the, the, the natural monopoly story. It's, the, it's, not, it's not that the free market failed and the government bureaucrats came riding to the rescue on white horses and, uh, and, and rescued the consumer. It was exactly the opposite, that uh, these were created as a taxing scheme to rip off the customer and then blame it all on uh, voracious capitalists. Uh, you know, that's, that's an old story, isn't it? Um, another another uh, well-known example of uh, the myth of market failure is, is uh, you all know what uh, this is. Let me see. Do you know what that is? That's what's on a keyboard, a computer keyboard. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a myth re related to QWERTY, in that uh, there's a I think the first economist to write about this was a guy named Paul David. He's a, a, a I'm pretty sure it might have been somebody else, but he's kind of known for that. And and he argued that uh, this is an example of a, of a, the locking in of how the free market locks in a a bad technology, an inefficient technology, and that's another form of market failure because uh, the QWERTY keyboard became the keyboard. Everybody uses QWERTY. And he argued that uh, there, there, was, there was at least one superior configuration of the keys uh, out there, but the free market, you know, the damn stupid consumers picked the QWERTY keyboard. What do they know? <laughs> and, uh, and the other one was, this was the name of the other one. Dvorak. And so, so the, the people who advocate this theory that the, this is a form of market failure, the, the locking in of an inferior technology, claim that this Dvorak keyboard uh, was superior. And there, they, they relate, the reason they gave was there was a couple of studies that were done 
by the United States Navy in, uh, during World War II on this keyboard, the Dvorak keyboard, that claim that it was, a, it was better to use this than the QWERTY keyboard, more efficient, fewer mistakes, faster typing, and so forth. And so, and so we had a new, in the 1980s, we had a new type of market failure, you know, path dependence, we call it path dependence. And so two economists challenged this. Stan Leibowitz and Steve Margolis, who wrote a very interesting book, by the way, called uh, uh, Winners, Losers, and Microsoft. If you're interested in the, the uh, antitrust issue in, this, in the context of the high technology industries from a free market perspective, uh, this is a good book to, to read, Leibowitz and Margolis. They challenged us because they, so the first thing they did was to say, well, well, well what, is, what is this Dvorak? Keyboard. Where did this come from? Turns out it came from a, uh, a lieutenant in the United States Navy named Dvorak who had a patent on the keyboard. And it turns out that he, he employed his own personal secretary to do these tests of the two keyboards. And, and, uh, and then he declared that his was superior. <laughs> That's kind of like General Motors getting a Toyota and saying, we have driven the General Motors cars and we have driven the Toyota and we have concluded that General Motors cars are better. So don't buy Toyotas. And so, and so, and so that was a death blow to uh, the Dvorak theory. And then they did additional real tests. You know, they got people who are good typists and they did over and over again, how many mistakes per minute and all that and found that it was pretty much a wash. And, you know, the, but the consumers, for whatever reason, the consumers spoke. They chose the QWERTY keyboard. So that was disproven also. Another type of uh, market failure that's popular is asymmetric information. And it's not spelled like ass as in the donkey. It's sort of A-S, just one S. So don't, if you spell it in a, in a paper of yours, don't, don't spell it like that. People will make fun of you if you, if you do that. Asymmetric information. And, uh, you know, people like George Stiglitz have had fun with this. In the, in the, I, I guess the origins of this was a 1970 article in the American Economic Review that, that, that uh, created what is known as the lemons problem. There's always a problem with free markets, a lemons problem. And it was written by uh, Jan, Janet Yellen's husband. Okay. And then he had another, another left-wing commie, commie economist like, like, uh, like the Fed chairman. And let's see if I can get you the citation. It's, uh, yeah, it's George Akerlof, and it's in, no, it's in the QJE, sorry. It wasn't in the American Economic Review. Quarterly Journal of Economics, 1970. Yeah, George Akerlof is, is uh, Mr. Fed Chairman. He's the, the husband of the Fed Chairman. And so, anyway, this, uh, the original argument was that uh, the, the sellers of products have more information about the products than the buyers. Therefore, the sellers of products have, have the, the ability to dupe you into buying crap. You know, he didn't use that language. That's my language, but he didn't, he didn't use the word crap, but he used the word lemons. You know, a lemon is just, you know, slang for a bad product. And he, he wrote mostly about the automobile industry. He claimed that the, the used car business would become progressively worse and worse and worse, more and more lemons. And, and then it may even disappear altogether because people can't trust car dealers. You just can't trust them. So you, who's going to who's ever going to buy a used car? And so, therefore, we need government regulation, more government regulation of uh, of, of the car industry. And but as a matter of fact, uh, even at that time, 1970, the the free market had solved the lemons problem with with warranties. And uh, so, even like today, for example, uh, I'm. I haven't bought a car from uh, CarMax in a while, but maybe six or seven years ago I sold one to CarMax. But, but uh, they have right in the windows of all their cars, uh, seven day, uh, no questions asked, money, uh, money back guarantee, as long as you don't wreck it and, or drive more than 3,000 miles or something like that. And of course, on top of that, there's a 30 day warranty that comes with it. So, so there's no chance that you're gonna buy a lemon. You have plenty of time to bring it to a mechanic and have it checked out. You know, and so the product warranties had already solved the lemons problem before George Ekerlof published his article about the lemons problem. 
and but he but he didn't even acknowledge product warranties at all. He made this apocalyptic prediction that it's all going to disappear. But but this whole in general, this whole idea of asymmetric information, you know, the modern economists have gone wild with this. You know, the the crash of two thousand and eight, they blame on asymmetric information. Mortgage brokers have more information about mortgages than you do, so they, these evil evil uh, free market monsters cause, therefore caused the mortgage crisis, uh, the uh, the crash of two thousand eight. Not the Fed, but uh, bank uh, mortgage uh, lenders. But the Austrians wrote about this a long time ago. When, when you think about it, in one of my papers in the, in the Q, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, I asked these rhetorical questions. Who knows more about home building, home builders or home buyers? Who knows more about supplying grocery stores with fresh meat, ranchers and farmers or average consumers? Who knows more about manufacturing automobiles, automobile engineers employed by the automobile manufacturers or car purchasers? Who knows more about producing and marketing clothing, clothing manufacturers or clothing shoppers? So, so in other words, asymmetric information as a form of market failure what is an attack on the division of labor in society. I mean, we all have specialized labor in doing something in our work lives. And so the thing that makes markets exist, markets exist because of asymmetric information. You know, I don't know how to build a house. But I do something else and I make money and I pay somebody to build my house who knows what they're doing. You know, I don't grow all my own food. You know, I don't grow any food because I'm not a farmer. I don't know what the hell I'm doing growing food. But I work doing this and I make money and I pay people who specialize in farming and in the distribution of food to do that. So they do, it's called the division of labor in society. It's also called asymmetric information, isn't it? It's, a, it's the same thing. So it's, it's what makes markets uh, work. It's, it's why they exist. And the Austrians all recognize this. Uh, I could quote Hayek, for example, uh, in a 1964 publication. This is in, a, in his book, Individualism and Economic Order, page 80. He said this, we need to remember only how much we have to learn in any occupation after we have completed our theoretical training, how big a part of our working life we spend learning particular jobs and how valuable an asset in all walks of life is knowledge of people, of local conditions and of special circumstances. The shipper who earns his living from using otherwise empty or half-filled journeys of tramp steamers, or the estate agent whose whole knowledge is almost exclusively one of temporary opportunities, or the arbitrageur who gains from local differences of commodity prices, are all performing eminently useful functions based on special knowledge of circumstances of the fleeting moments not known to others. So... Hayek would call this the division of knowledge in society. You know, the, when, uh, when Mises wrote about this also in Human Action, but he wrote during the machine age. And we really hadn't had any of the information age yet. And Hayek also wrote during the machine age. But of course, he was a prophet of the information age. His, his writings on the use of knowledge in society. There's even an article, by the way, in the New Yorker magazine in the early 90s called The Price Prophet about Hayek, which I highly recommend. It's fascinating. You know, it's called it's it's called the uh, the price. P R O P H E T. It's called and it's about Friedrich Hayek and how his his article, the use of knowledge in society, which the mystery speaker last night said is the foundation of all his whole business, Overstock dot com. Uh, uh, that uh, you know that that uh, it foresaw the internet age. It, it foresaw the information age that we're in now. You know, because it talked about the the importance of the use of information in society. Okay, and but Mises himself uh, said this: in an economic system in which every actor is in position to recognize correctly the market situation with the same degree of insight, he said he wrote: the adjustment of prices to every change in the data would be achieved at one stroke. That is, if everybody had the same information, uh, there would be no no ever changing in prices. Um, it is impossible to imagine such uniformity in the correct cognition and appraisal of changes in data, except by the intercession of superhuman agencies. We would have to assume that every man is approached by an angel informing him of the change in data. 
Moreover, even if market participants did possess the same data and information, they are bound to appraise it differently. So Mises, even Mises was saying in human action that to have symmetrical information, it would be sort of a, an angel would have to come to earth and, and, and enlighten us all and you know, put all this information in our heads. And, so that, and that's, what, that's sort of George Stiglitz economics, isn't it? You know, and these people who, who write article after article after article after article about the failures of the market due to asymmetric information. You know, how easy is that you know, to, 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 to claim, aha, here's another industry where the people who produce the product know more about the product than the consumers of the product. You could, you know, you could, if you live 300 years, you could can continue writing articles about this over and over and over again. And that's how Stiglitz won the Nobel Prize, pretty much, uh, 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 doing that. But, me, but and then the, f the final thing I'll say here is the real asymmetric information, there is a real problem, but the source of the problem is government. Who knows more about foreign policy machinations? The bureaucrats in the State Department, Hillary Clinton, or you? You know, who knows more about what the EPA is up to? EPA bureaucrats or you? You know, pick your government agency. We're all rationally ignorant about almost everything government does. So if you want to know where there's a massive, you know, gigantic, spectacular difference in information, it's with government versus the, the uh, citizens of the society. Uh, you know, no human mind could possibly comprehend even a tiny percentage of 1% of what government does, of what even the Auburn city government does today, let alone all, all government. That's the real asymmetric information problem there. And so, you know, we can be banned, the whole country can be bamboozled into waging wars in the Middle East over what? Uh, you know, over, over some slogan, I think, who was it? I think it was Napolitano who said uh, the purpose of the Iraq war was Saddam Hussein tried to kill my daddy, to, qu quoting, <laughs> quoting George W. Bush. And I believe that's probably true. That's probably why we had that war in Iraq, uh, revenge against Saddam Hussein. And he did try to assassinate Bush. Bush, Bush went over. Bush Senior went over to Saudi Arabia, and the king of Saudi Arabia gave him a, uh, some kind of award for uh, helping him rip off American consumers in the oil business. And, uh, and, and, and some, some, some bomb went off somewhere, and they blamed Saddam Hussein on it. They, they said it was an assassination attempt gone bad. But that's probably the reason for that. So I guess we're about out of time. I had a list of about five more here, but uh, but uh, I'll stay here if you want. I'll stay here for the next forty-five minutes if we can do that. But, but, uh, but now we'll quit instead. Okay. Thank you very much.